we met before? Right, I didn't think so. I'm Hermione Granger. And you are? Pleasure. Are there any more of you? Right. Um, well, I did expect there would be rather a few of us here at um, this study period, but um, no matter. I have written down a few different things that I thought best that we could go over before our owls next week. Mm-hmm. Um, was there anything in particular that you wanted to focus on? Right. Um, I do actually have a few different um, creatures written down. Um, so I suppose we could go through those and if there are any that I have missed then just let me know. Great. Okay, so I thought that we would start with a simple potion. So, I've got the pepper cup potion. I wrote it down. Um, are you at all aware of what a pepper cup potion is? I'll just refresh your memory. So, a pepper cup potion is designed to improve health relieve coughs and colds, though it does have one major side effect. It causes steam to dribble from the patient's ears for several hours afterward. It can also be used to quickly alleviate body temperature. So, I thought that this would be quite a simple and easy potion for us to create now. Okay, I've got all of the ingredients, but I'll go through it with you. Now, first ingredient we have is flux weed, and I thought I would pre measure um, all of the ingredients beforehand so that you could visualise exactly how many that you would need. So feel free to take notes. Okay, so let me take this flux weed out. Okay, and there we are. First ingredient. Next calls for Shade. Now this calls for one, two, three, four, five, six nightshade berries to be exact. those berries in. There we go. Next is Owlet's Wing. Now this is approximately one wing. So it says after these first three ingredients, you just need to stir. Okay. Next 
is mermaid tears so um, I did fill it a little bit full um, but it's approximately five to six drops and we are making the pepper cup potion just for one individual Again, another liquid. This time we have Aromantula venom. Now this can be a very, very nasty potion if adding too much of the venom so you have to be very very careful with the venom that is why we put it into a little vial okay so please do not write it down please do not put the venom into a larger vial just to make sure that we save ourselves from any accidents should start to really bubble and fizzle and you know that you've done it right if I now give it a second stir and it starts to create a very light smoke do you see? Okay, next we have these dragon scales. in the dragon scales gently okay also sprinkled in is beetle eyes so we have these dried beetle eyes again about the same amount as the dragon scales and you just sprinkle those in as well Are you getting all of this? Right, yes. It is quite a simple potion, um, so I don't think that you would have too much trouble in recreating this during your owls next week. Mm -hmm. Good. Next, we have a very, very lucrative ingredient. This is actually unicorn's blood. Now, it is very, very rare, so we need to use it very, very sparingly. Um, it is great for healing properties and can only be used in very, very small amounts. Well, um, the reasoning being is unicorn's blood can actually be quite an addictive substance. It creates new life in people. So um, if you have too much, uh, it can become something that you uh, rely upon and you become half of a life. Um, you never have full existence or being ever 
never again. So we use this in healing medicines, but in very, very sparing amounts. Hence again, the very small vial. It's really important actually that um, you make a note of that. well-being and don't worry too much about getting the pixie dust on your hands as well you can actually um, use it almost as like a healing property on yourself it can be rubbed into the skin to bring well-being we're almost complete with the potion next we have porcupine quills now the potion asks for three porcupine pills so I have one two three kind of um, crumble the porcupine quills into the potion. Okay. Final stir. You will really start to hear the bubbling now because um, it is starting to get very, very hot. Porcupine quills make it um, start to really heat up. They have warming properties. Um, these do actually cause the steam from flowing out of the ears, but they are essential because they give that warm sensation um, throughout the body, which helps it to heal. Okay. We have just a little dash of moonstone. Quite a lot in childhood, and 
and it is a really really essential potion to learn for your owls I think it's actually one of the simpler ones but uh, very very important uh, do you need any assistance with your notes at all or are you okay you're all right okay well in that case I'm going to just finish this potion up to the side. Simple enough? Great. Okay, so next I thought that we could possibly do some spells. Um, I wrote down all of the spells, significant spells at least, that we have to know for owls uh, just from our charms classes over the past four years. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, next year we actually move from Charms to Transfiguration. So this is actually a really important time to refresh all of those Charms classes before we don't get them again. Right? Okay, so, ones at the ready. So first, we have Lumos. 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 Um... And make sure not to have the intent behind the spell, otherwise you'll kind of set everything off. Again, Lumos. 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 Very good. Next we have Expelliarmus. 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 Again. Expelliarmus. 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 Good. Then, Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. And of course, it is Leviosa, not Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Very good. Next we have Alohomora. 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 Good. Then we have Flipendo. 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 Flipendo, 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 flipendo. Next, Nox, 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 Nox. Good. Then we have Engordio. Engordio, 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 Engordio. Then, Incendio, 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 Incendio. Then, Reducio. So we had Engorgio, then Inducio, 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 Inducio. Then we have Venite Incantatum, Venite Incantatum, Venite Incantatum, Venite Incantatum, Venite Incantatum. Venite Incantatum. Then we have Petrificus Totalis. Petrificus Totalis. Petrificus Totalis. Petrificus Totalis. Petrificus Totalis. 
then ridiculous 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 good I think you're actually getting the hang of this then immobilis 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 then scorchify 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 very good um next we have silencio 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 then mumble wimble 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 then lastly spongify 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 very good okay so that is all of the spells that um, I thought would be particularly important on our owl's test now I did grab my copy of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt's Commander and I um, indicated a few different beasts and um, creatures that may be of particular interest during our tests um, do you have anything in particular that you may want to go over? okay well we'll go through my own and then you're more than welcome to let me know Okay, so first, the Hungarian Horntail. Supposedly the most dangerous of all dragon breeds, the Hungarian Horntail has black scales and is lizard-like in appearance. It has yellow eyes, bronze horns, and similarly coloured spikes that protrude from its long tail. The Horntail has one of its longest fire-breathing ranges, up to 50 feet. The Hungarian Horntail feeds on goats, sheep, and, whenever possible, humans. Um, next I had... The Gnome. The Gnome is a common garden pest found throughout Northern Europe and North America. It may reach a foot in height, with a disproportionately large head and hard bony feet. The gnome can be expelled from the garden by swinging it in circles until dizzy and then dropping it over the garden wall. Alternatively, a jarvy may be used, though many wizards nowadays find this method of gnome control too brutal. Um, and also the Grindelow. A haunt, pale green water demon. The Grindelow is found in lakes throughout Britain and Ireland. It feeds on small fish and is aggressive towards wizards and muggles alike. Though mer people have been known to domesticate it, the Grindelow has very long fingers, which, though they exert a powerful grip, are easy to break. Uh, Remora. 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 Ah. Remora. The 
Remora is a silver fish found in the Indian Ocean. Powerfully magical, it can anchor ships and is a guardian of seafarers. The Remora is highly valued by the International Confederation of Wizards, which has set many laws in place to protect the Remora from wizard poachers. Finally, I just wanted to look at werewolves. The werewolf is found worldwide, though it is believed to have originated in Northern Europe. Humans turn into werewolves only when bitten. There is no known cure, though recent developments in potion making have to a great extent alleviated the worst symptoms. Once a month, out of the full moon, the otherwise sane and normal wizard or muggle Afflicted transforms into a murderous beast. Almost uniquely among fantastic creatures, the werewolf actively seeks humans in preference to any other kind of prey. That's all I uh, wanted to look at. Did you think of anything else? Oh, yes. Uh, let me look for it. is a Japanese water demon that inhibits shallow ponds and rivers, often said to look like a monkey with fish scales instead of fur. It has a hollow in the top of its head in which it carries water. The kappa feeds on human blood, but may be persuaded not to harm a person if it is thrown a cucumber with that person's name carved into it. In confrontation, a wizard should trick the kappa into bowing. If it does so, the water in the hollow of its head will run out, depriving it of all its strength. Okay, um, and then finally, I thought it may be of importance to read up on the history of the broomstick. I had a conversation with one of our professors who said that we may see it on the test. Um, so I grabbed my copy of Quidditch Through the Ages by Kenilworthy Wisp and um, I thought I could just simply read it to you. Okay, so the evolution of the flying broomstick. No spell yet devised enables wizards to fly unaided in human form. Those few animagus who transform into winged creatures may enjoy flight, but they are a rarity. The wizard or witch who finds him or herself transfigured into a bat may take to the air, but having a bat's brain, they are sure to forget where they want to go the, move the moment that they take flight. Levitation is commonplace, but our ancestors were not content with hovering five feet from the ground. They wanted more. They wanted to fly like birds, but without the inconvenience of growing feathers. We are so accustomed these days to the fact that every wizarding household in Britain owns at least one flying broomstick, that we rarely stop to ask ourselves why. Why should the humble broom have become the one object legally allowed as a means of wizarding transport? Why did we in the West not adapt the carpet so beloved by our Eastern brethren? Why did we choose to produce flying barrels, flying armchairs, flying bathtubs? Why brooms? Shrewd enough to see that their muggle neighbours would seek to exploit their powers if they knew their full extent, witches and wizards kept themselves to themselves long before the international statute of wizarding secrecy came into effect. If they were to keep a means of flight in their houses, it would necessarily be something discreet, something easy to hide. The broomstick was ideal for this purpose. It required no explanation, no excuse if found by muggles, and was easily portable and inexpensive. Nevertheless, 
the first rooms bewitched for flying purposes had their drawbacks. Records show that witches and wizards in Europe were flying broomsticks as early as the year 962 AD. A German illuminated manuscript of this period shows three warlocks dismounting from their brooms with looks of exquisite discomfort on their faces. Guthrie Lochrin, a Scottish wizard writing in 1107, spoke of the splinter-filled buttocks and bulging piles he suffered after a short broom ride from Montrose to Arbroath. A medieval broomstick on display in the Museum of Quidditch in London gives us an insight into Lochrin's discomfort. A thick, knotty handle and unvarnished ash with hazel twigs bound crudely to one end. It is neither uncomfortable it is neither comfortable nor aerodynamic. The charms placed upon it were simply basic. It will only move forwards at one speed. It will go up and down and stop. As wizarding families in those days made their own brooms, there was one enormous variation in speed, comfort and handling of the transport available to them. By the 12th century, however, Wizards had learned to barter services so that a skilled maker of brooms could exchange them for the potions his neighbour might make better himself. Once broomsticks came more comfortable, they were flown for pleasure rather than merely used as a means of getting from point A to point B. Okay, there we are. Um, so that is actually all that I had organized to have during this study session. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, again, I did expect other people to come, but if you see anybody that is worried about their owls next week, then um, make sure to let me know. And we can always go through a few different things. Okay. Well, um, I made a little bit of a mess drawing the potion, so I'm going to give a little bit of a clean up. Um, I suppose that I can see you a little bit later. Okay, thank you again for coming. Best of luck.